Well, good morning, everybody. This is Mark Boyle. I am the prepper guy and also um, creator of a new site, Prepper Gal. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today was something I was watching that I, I think many of you might already have seen, or maybe not. Uh, it, it just depends on how how much time you get to watch stuff, you know, and, and keep up with what the hell's going on with this, this election fraud that, you know, we're all talking about. But it's uh, by Mike Lindell. It's a new one. He had the, 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 the one documentary called Absolute Proof. And uh, hopefully you've had a chance to watch that. And now this one is called uh, Scientific Proof. And it's uh, by a physicist that literally teaches some kind of crazy ass calculus and stuff you know relating to uh census data and stuff like that so in it it's showing the the actual population of each county the registered voters and then the people that voted and how his data shows that there was actually an algorithm running it because the 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 certain uh, qualifiers in the algorithm and the way people vote were exactly the same in all 3,300 counties in America. And, and you can overlay the data and see that it's a perfect matchup every time, especially dealing with a couple of these uh, spikes and stuff that happen. And so um, I know a lot of my listeners might think, well, Mark, uh, you know, you're preaching to the choir. And that's fine because a lot of times the choir's not fucking paying attention. And they're checking their, their iPhones and stuff, goofing around. And then uh, a lot of my listeners might be thinking, well, Mark, uh, I'm, I'm really done with this. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just tired of hearing about it. I don't have time. It's over. Drop it. You know, it's like the uh, move on kind of thing it's like okay but it, it, it's really interesting and what the, the one thing that he had mentioned uh, the scientist and Mike Lindell had all actually commented on too was was uh, how in a lot of the states now we're having recall elections and he says it's kind of funny because with a recall election every signature on the petition has to be verified Every uh, every vote has to be on a certain piece of paper that's printed by the state, and it has to be a certain size, and they have to use their special ink, and and every vote is once again verified that it's an actual citizen in that area that's doing the recall for like Governor Ducey and stuff. And he said, but yet when it comes to a national election, we just don't care. And it's just like ah, oh, whatever, mail it in. We're not going to verify it. We're not going to have all these checks and and stuff to make sure that there's, you know, poll watchers from both parties keeping an eye on things and all this. And, and he's like, it's kind of weird that, you know, at a state level, they would be that fanatical about it. And, and on a national level, everyone's like asleep at the wheel. And it, it, and it got me thinking, does it take much to get my gears turning and, and, and wondering what just happened and what did he just say? And, I, and I've, I've, I've talked about this so many times that it, it probably makes, you know, blood shoot out of your eyes. It's like I'm going to talk about it again. But I've always said that the 17th Amendment really messed up America. Because before that, all we voted for constitutionally was our representatives in our local precinct. And that was that. And then, then those representatives that you had a direct correlation and knowledge in, of and a friendship with, and, and, and the precincts used to be so much smaller that they represented a, a lot less people than nowadays because of gerrymandering, that you knew them. And, and they had their, the pulse of that community in that precinct because they lived in that precinct. They were part of that precinct. They went to school in that precinct. You know, their parents lived there. Um, if their dad was a miner, then he understood or she understood the, the importance of mining and mining laws and, and, and these regulations and stuff that could hurt not only the whole community, but their own family. 
you know, so they were very cautious of what they were going to allow, you know, the state to do and then also the federal government to do. So they, they really, they had, they were the, the, the pulse meter of America back then. You know, they were like the glucose meter that bricked their skin and checked for blood and went, this is exactly how much blood sugar you have. You know, it's that granular. And then, and then the 17th Amendment came along and changed that. And, uh, and how they did that, I mean, we still elect our representatives. But the representatives back before the 17th Amendment, quite literally, you know, picked your senators. The senators were appointed by the representatives. And it made sense when you really think about it, because it's like I elected, you know, Jane over here to be my representative. She will go to at a state level and, and they, all the other representatives might be hundreds of them if, you know, we weren't gerrymandering the shit out of everything. But let's say there's, you know, 50 of them. Then, uh, so she would go to, to the state level and, and all of the 50, 100, 200, whatever representatives there were in your steady, in your state, because there wasn't gerrymandering, so there were probably a lot more of them, they would, they would kind of kick around the idea and say, well, you know, we've handled all the state level issues, you know, which aren't really that much if you're not meddling in everyone's business. And, and, and so now there's some things coming up that will require us to have a senator in Washington to, to vote and say yes and no and, and, and write this federal law. And so then they would go, well, let's pick Bob and Mary over there. And they're like, okay, you know. And, and so th- your, your representative, once again, follow this. The people that you had direct knowledge of and knew them and went to school with them and handpicked would now get together with all the other ones that had their finger on the pulse of that precinct and then they would they would pick two senators to represent the state in this opinion and then they would go to Washington and do what they used to do back then whatever that is that they, they're still supposed to do but they don't because well, they're all morons so then then that same body of representatives that you voted for and that had their had the pulse of all of their precincts and therefore the state would pick electors that could not be the same group of you know representatives and it couldn't be the same people that were going to be the senators because they were appointed so they could change them you know they they just picked people and 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 those those electors would do the voting or the bidding of that specific that specific precinct so then it was voted up broken up into districts that had many precincts maybe and and they'd say okay you 10 have picked frank over here and and you have decided that frank is going to vote for candidate a and b because they they would pick the vice president also And, and and so then this other group would pick an elector and maybe that area of the state, see, still sticking with the whole representation thing, would decide that they're going to f- pick um, Sally over here to be their representative and they're going to vote for candidate, you know, A and B, which is president and vice president, but they're going to pick different names. And, and, and back before this got all, you know, effed up, what would happen is you had more than, you know, two-party system. You know, it was it was more diversified. You know, if you look at some of the uh, the electoral votes and the election of George Washington when he ran against John Adams, there wasn't just George Washington and John Adams. There was a Whig party, a Federalist party, an Anti-Federalist party. So there might have been, you know, 10, 15 names 
in the hat. They were all running as president. And then they would pick two. And, and the second place guy became the vice president. So you kind of had to like everyone. But it, it, that's how it happened. They changed that a little bit. And that's really kind of irrelevant. You know, because George Washington could have picked John Adams to be his running mate because John Adams like, you know, I'm not going to do that whole presidential thing. But, yeah, I'll be your running mate. You know, maybe you and me can pull enough votes together in the electors to, to be president. And then we'll, we'll do, our, do our thing. You know, so, but they would pick two names and then they would go to Washington back in the day. They had to go there by horseback or whatever. So it took some time. And that's why all these elections, you know, there's, there's the election happens like on this day and then that and all that. But back in the day, the electoral votes were counted on a certain day. So the, the, the states would get together and they would already have the names picked and their electors picked. And the electors had already talked to their representatives and said, okay, it's, it's Bob and, and Tony. It's George Washington and, and John Adams. And, and then they would go and, and, and vote, and then they were counted, and that, that was that. And then they would have the inauguration and all this other happy shit. So you see, it was always set up that states controlled the elections for representatives and then the president, the electoral thing. And so as a citizen, all I was required to do was vote for my representative and then go back to work. And that was every two years. So it kind of kept you kind of awake in what was going on. You know, it wasn't every six years and every four years for senators and presidents. It was just every two years you picked your representative and then you went back to work. And so you, you had a pretty granular grip on that representative short hair, so to speak, to go, hey, you've, you, last couple times you went there and you, you were not representing us at all. We are a farming community and you were, you know, talking all this crap and going along with the people over there at the northern part of the state that are all into logging. They know nothing about farming. You're, you're cutting our throat here, kicking your ass to the curb. So every two years, see, you had basically term limits if people were paying attention, which they were back then. And, and we weren't so interconnected back then to where it really mattered if, if, the, if the representatives in the northern part of the state were pushing more for mining or logging and, and the southern parts were more into farming and, and cattle and, and other kinds of mining because they didn't really commingle all that much. The representative really represented his people. They just didn't like it when your representative went and started, you know, preaching or filibustering or talking about something that had nothing to do with your district and precinct and all, however, you know, that group was that you had, those three, five, ten, twenty thousand 20,000 people stay in that circle, damn it. So that's how it worked. And now when you, you know, so like Mike Lindell is saying, because well, I don't understand why the, these, these uh, you know, recalls and stuff are so, so particular on how this happens. And yet at a national election, it's like, yeah, whatever, send in your ballot. Yeah, you can do it online, you know. You know, put it in a bottle and throw it in the ocean. We'll, we'll scrape the ocean during the election and count the votes. They didn't care back then, but now they seem to, you know, have this big problem with voter fraud. And if you really analyze what happened during the 17th Amendment and this, this change, once we started voting, you know, in a, in a giant state level for a senator, then basically the state, and depending on your advertising and budget and how you could, could persuade the southern and this northern and the middle of the state to vote for, you know, one of these these two senators, um, you know, got to vote every six years. So you had taken that one really strong thing, that tool that the representatives had in their tool belt, and took it away. Because before that, you and the, the, the representatives, your people, your neighbors would pick the senator and go, okay, 
go to Washington. They were they were appointed. And then they would go to Washington and do whatever the representatives had told them to do. This is your your job description for this trip to Washington. That's it. And then if those people started deviating because they were, you know, swayed by the trappings of, you know, Washington and the, all the grandeur and the parties and hobnobbing with the, you know, all the other people that think they're important and, you know, the, the lobbyists and stuff, all of a sudden you're like, well, huh, I'm pretty damn cool. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to vote this way. Then the representatives would contact you and say, you've been recalled. Your, your replacement will be there, you know, next week to handle the, the important matters of the state. You can get your ass home or you can stay there. We don't really care. You're no longer our senator. See, so that was a very strong tool that we, the people, had in the form of representation. We picked our representatives, and if they were good people because they were salt of the earth right from your community, might have been your brother or father or mother or sister, whatever. You know, back then, there weren't as many women in politics, but still, it could have been. You know, so we wouldn't have needed a national suffragette movement you know, to let women vote, it, it, it didn't matter. You know, if, if, they were, if they were active in the community and, and wanted to be a representative, they, I guess they could have. There was really no rules that said they couldn't. You know, I mean, there were, there were rules about land ownership that gave you the right to vote and to be active in politics, but that's a different subject for a different matter. But when you even think of that, it makes sense. You owned land, so therefore you had skin in the game. You had your land. And every law that was passed on a state and federal level affected you as a land, a private property owner. So they, they've distanced us from that too. So you see that when the senators got elected by this, on a state level, then they could, they could buy their election. And that's why it costs so much money now. And it wasn't connected to the, to the people, even though you could say it was one man, one vote, you know, one woman, one vote. Uh, so it's connected to the people. No, it's easier to control a bigger group through knee-jerk reactions and, and political ads than in a small town of granular thinking of a farming community that would pick a representative and then they would all get together and go, no, we're not going to use John McCain. He's, you know, he's a war hero. It's like, yeah, I know. And, and he said some good things and he said some bad things, but he gets to Washington and he forgets what we told him to do. You know, he's just, he's, he's a loose cannon and, and, he, and, he, and he votes however he wants. And sometimes that is diametrically opposed to what 50% of the representatives in this state had appointed him to do because there's two senators per state. So they would usually divide the state up at a, at a state level and go, okay, you guys, you vote for, you pick your senator and we'll pick ours because your needs really at the northern part of the state or in the center of the state are quite a bit different than the needs of the outlying areas. So you pick this person, we'll pick that person. So, so that was a tool. That was a very good power tool we had. And when the 17th Amendment was enacted, we lost it. And that was because FDR understood that. And, and he was a socialist prick and, and wanted to have more control over the election process. And then he also, because of that, you know, pushed for the popular vote then. And, and, and so... It was, it was all hinged on the 17th Amendment. So then we started electing our president as individual citizens. And it was never meant to be that way because, you know, you can get enough money together to elect a senator because you're controlling, you know, 50% of the state's group think. And, and if you're good at demographics and, and marketing, yeah, you're, you're, the, you're the guy, especially if you got the money. You know, then you win and you're... You're the girl from that part of the state. And that was that. Well, president, it's like, holy shit. Now we're only going to pick one of two parties because we don't really have 10 parties anymore because, well, you just can't have that in a Super Bowl. There's only two teams. Can't be a winner if you have four teams. Well, you could do a double elimination. It's like, no, it takes too long. But see, with the Electoral College, it was just whoever got the majority of the votes. 
not 51%. Just, you know, you got three more than this person, so you win. Da, done. So you, you had, a, had it, you know, working. And then they said, well, let's do presidential elections so Donald Trump can spend a billion dollars and, 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 and Biden can spend a billion dollars. And, and then they get their machine up and running and they play these sociographic games and these demographic games and, and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, everybody like knows you and loves you, which before that, it really didn't matter. It was your, your record and your character that got you elected as president. And that was it. So the, the long way around, obviously, because I just wanted to fill all of this stuff in with some background information and lay the, the field. I hope it didn't bore you too much. So when Mike Lindell says these, these recounts are really kind of humorous, you know, a recount versus a national election for the president. It's like, oh, my God, how could, you know, how could we be that way? Well, that's, that's how. See, before, you never had a popular vote for the president. The president was technically voted for by the states because the president represents the states on a world stage. And then the senators kind of represented the, the people at a, at a local or level for law writing and stuff like that. And then the representatives had total control over the senators. So the power went from the people to the representatives to the Senate to the president. We always had control. Well, now you can see how the 17th Amendment, you know, took all those tools out of our toolbox. Just boom. And neutered representation. The whole purpose of America was, you know, representation. And now we have zero. We think we do because we're voting, but we're just being conned into believing that Pepsi is better than Coke or Coke is better than Pepsi because there's two choices. RC Cola is really not even talked about, you know, because RC is not going to spend millions and millions of dollars to be number three. They're just number three by virtue of this, the way it is, you know, let Coke and Pepsi battle it out. So you see how, you know, it, it messed everything up. We lost our representation. So that is why way back in the day, they created these laws that were the same laws for for anything important were done by the states. And, and then your your precincts just, all you were doing was voting for one person every two years, just one person in a very small precinct or, or whatever the district that you, your representative, representative, that was it. You could literally, if you wanted to be the representative of a certain area, you could just go knock on doors for two years and, 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 and get elected. You know, have some commercials on TV or radio or back then, you know, have somebody write a pamphlet about how cool you are and, and distribute it. And that was that. And it has gotten big, but it's still a smaller group. Even with gerrymandering, you still have a better chance of winning in that as a representative. And then no one cared about senators and presidents. So the, the fraud was very easy to monitor and, and control. Whereas nowadays, it, it's not. So I guess, you know, with all of this, uh, the long route and, and laying the groundwork, I hope you can understand that it was set up really well. And, and it's hard to blame America and, and, and the way it is now on a constitution that hasn't been maintained. You know, your car doesn't run because you never put gas in it and you didn't keep the tires good. And, you know, you don't blame the manufacturer of the car, you know, because you never took care of it. And so we've allowed these things to happen. And I don't know if the 17th Amendment could be repealed or replaced or voided or whatever they do with it, just like prohibition. But that would be a, a good start. But see, we the people are, are not happy with that. You know, we want the one man, one vote. We bought into it. So that's why I guess a, a recall election is so different and so watched as opposed to a national election. Because there, there was no checks and balances ever set up with a national election. It was just never done that way. So the, 
why would they why would they create checks and balances? The checks and balances were in the way it was supposed to be. And so this is all a very big gray area. And and it kind of, I, I, I would imagine you could say this kind of happened in some of the other elections, like with the the Bush and Gore battle and some of these disputed elections that were testing the waters legally and in court because, you know, we've gone to a different business model, a different election model. And maybe, I don't, I don't know the law good enough, but maybe, just maybe, according to the Constitution still, and even with the 17th Amendment and stuff like that, when the Supreme Court said you have no standing, they might have actually not been being dicks. They might have actually been right. You know, when you factor in the unknown things that, that we're dealing with, because of the 17th Amendment, maybe we don't have standing. Maybe as a people in a state, because we've allowed the 17th Amendment to stand and all this stare decisis in this case law to set precedence, we legally have no standing because we have no representation because we've allowed it to be taken from us. And, and so if you really are a scholar and you look into the fact of why did the Supreme Court say that we have no standing in this election, it might give you pause to think, oh my God, we the people no longer run this country, which I, you know, I'm not talking figurative because we know we don't run this country. But that is why. You see that one simple thing that was removed from our tool belt, that very important key thing, had had a ripple effect that now in case law and court law and Supreme Court says, you really don't have a vote or a say in this anymore on a granular we the people level. It's, it's just, it's been removed. And, and then we'd go, well, that's, that's just fucked up. It's Trump's fault. That's just not right. It was Bush caused this from the beginning. It's the Republicans. It's the damn Democrats. No, I mean, yes, FDR was a Democrat that pushed the 17th Amendment and all these changes. And there's probably other amendments out there that, you know, aren't as, as in your face and yet might help, you know, help them steal our standing. So when you have to really hear what the, the, the Supreme Court said. You have no standing. Who's you? Oh, the, the states, the 13 states that jumped onto this bandwagon to sue and, and take it to the Supreme Court. And maybe when they're saying you have no standing, they meant we, the people, have no standing. And you should look at that and go, why is that? And I guess if the Supreme Court wanted to be a, a team player, they could have wrote in their dissent, and maybe they did, and it was just not talked about because it wasn't a hot-button issue. That's like, you have no standing because you allowed the 17th Amendment to be ratified. So why don't you fix this and stop coming to us and asking us to fix it? Because we don't make law. We have opinions, and in our opinion, you have no standing. So go do your effing homework and figure it out. You, the people that seem to like to walk around and go one man, one vote. And I have representation and America is a great country because we have taxation with representation. And the Supreme Court's like, no, not so much. You just don't know how screwed you've been. So that's my, uh, my thinking of the day. And, and like I said, I could probably go in and fill in some more history. But you need to look at the 17th Amendment. You need to look at these court cases that the Supreme Court said you have no standing and shot down a lot of these, these election fraud things because they were all talking about what? A national election. Why? Well, I don't know. It's not in the Constitution. So the Supreme Court could sit there and go, I don't really know what you're talking about. This amendment kind of screwed everything up and, and nobody uh, plugged up all the holes. So until the states do that, you have no standing. You guys all have a great and wonderful day. Watch the movie, uh, the video. I, I'm going to post it around where I can. Uh, scientific proof and obviously absolute proof. I mean, it, it's good to see that not like it verifies the fact that we need to vote for our president in a national election, you know, by popular vote. But it does show you 
what's going on in the background. And since we do have popular vote, how far they will go to steal that election from us. And it's probably the same group think that went so far as to take away our standing by enacting the 17th Amendment. See, when we think they're helping us, they're, they're showing us, you know, a, a taste test like Coke or Pepsi. But meanwhile, it's only RC Cola. And we don't see it. We only see what they say. And we go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Just like prohibition. You know, it was you know, a bunch of do-gooders that think that people shouldn't be able allowed to drink as an American citizen, kind of do whatever they want. And it got passed because of a bunch of knee-jerk reactions of, of women that were being abused and beaten, which was probably a, a very, 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 very small minority. But they got the movement and it got passed. Thank God they repealed it or wrote another one to say that one was a stupid idea. Let's do this. But, you know, it, it's the same thing. So we're being sold these things. And, and and who's selling it to us? Who would be so maniacal to do this to us? Well, the same people that that set up this Dominion voting thing and took away our vote because it's like, well, if we're going to do popular vote, well, Trump might win. So now we need to duck that all up too. And... and, and and so this is what you're up against. See, the, the, the plans of evil or the devil or whoever are so complex and so deep-seated that this, the deep state is a good name for it because it's really deep and it's dark and it's in little rooms that you don't even know exist. And, and they, they, they scheme and plan and, and, and steal from us. They take our money from us. They take our wages from us. They take our property from us. They take our our lives and our children and their education from us. And, and we don't see it because they're, meanwhile, pushing the narrative that, you know, they care and, and, and we're stupid parents and we shouldn't be in charge or whatever their narrative is. And, and, and then once again, we buy into it. And then we're like, oh, okay, like our borders. We buy into it. We're not that kind of people. Well, I guess we're really not. And it's like, well, our hands are tied. Oh, I guess your hands are tied. Nothing I could do about it. Oh, I guess there's nothing to do about it. So wake up. Has new meaning. Wake up, America. Love you all. Talk to you. Enjoy the, the, the shit storm we've created. We made too many compromises already. Too many retreats. We invade our space. And we fall back. I'm your huckleberry. The line must be drawn here. This far, no farther. That's just my game.